Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to the Davos style lecture about new technologies, commercialization, referring to the core values of continuity of care. So when I've been asked to, uh, to moderate a Davos style, Davos style lecture, I went to the best source, to the Wikipedia, to understand what is Davos style lecture. Well, actually, the Davos style format is a, a format with it in which each speaker making a 10 minutes introduction, followed by discussions in the panel and with the audience. No PowerPoint presentations or formal speeches will be used to foster an open debate and lovely inter interaction. But I think that we will not see such a Davos style a discussion today because this, is, uh, this goes better when we are face to face and not when uh, we are pre-recording our discussions. So today we have three distinguished participants. The first, and I will represent them all together, and then we will hear their, their lectures, and we will gather together again at the end for an open discussion, and, and we will get questions from the audience. The first one is Donald Lee. He is the president of Wonka World Organization, the World Organization of Family Doctors. He is a specialist in family medicine and private practice in Hong Kong. He is the censor of the Hong Kong College of Family Physicians. Dr. Lee also dedicates much of his professional time to academia and teaching in Hong Kong and in China. He is honorary fellow of the University of Hong Kong, honorary fellow of the Chinese University of Hong Kong, and have many, many other affiliations. He is registered mainland China medical practitioner and has contributed to training and development of family medicine in the mainland for over 20 years. Dr. Lee is an active member of many Hong Kong governmental and non-governmental organizations and public health bodies. And this is only a very, very short, in a nutshell, his bio. The second speaker will be Yona Yafe. He is an associate professor in Community Health School of Medicine, University of Nino Braga, Portugal. He is a family physician with special interest in counseling. He graduated with a degree of MDCM from the Faculty of Medicine at the McGill University, McGill University in Montreal, Canada. He completed specialty training in family medicine in a four-year program at the Hebrew University in Jerusalem, Israel. He completed master's degree in family medicine at the University of Western Ontario, London, Canada. He was a senior lecturer actually in parallel with me in our department at the family medicine department at Tel Aviv University for nine years. He is currently a professor in community health in the School of Medicine of the University of Ninho in Portugal, where he teaches the family, society, and health process and supervises students and researchers. The third speaker will be Norbert Donner Banshoff. He is a professor of general practice at the University of Marburg. His research interests include the diagnosis in primary care including diagnostic errors, communication and decision-making, health services research, and cardiovascular disease. A major work of, on medical diagnosis is in preparation. He convinced and supervised a major research program developed and evaluating the Marburg Health, Health Arts Corps. Together with other German academic departments, he initiated the development of Atribal TM, a library of digital decision aids for general practice. Based on his research in general practice, he coined the term inductive foregoing, foregoing describes it, describing a central part of the diagnostic process. So let's start with Donald Lee, and the stage is yours. Hello, I'm Donald Lee, president of World Organization of Family Doctors, Wonka. I'm happy to offer a few comments as a preamble to this panel presentation, and will follow with some wrap-up comments when Yona and Novert have presented. The COVID-19 pandemic and the global response to it highlighted the challenges we face in family medicine and general practice through our usual face-to-face -face continuous services to our patients. New technologies were quickly adopted where they were <clears throat> used to allow us to for our follow-up with patients. But we are conscious that continuity, a key principle of family medicine, can be challenged by the technology. Data can be collected remotely 
everyone is far more connected to sources than information, including our patients, and I'm aware that some of the problems that arise as a result of this. So let's hear what our colleagues have to say today. Dear friends, welcome. I'm John Yaffe, a family doctor in Porto, Portugal, known to my family and friends as Yona. And I'm pleased and honored to be here with my friends Donald and Norbert today <clears throat> to talk about the changing concept of continuity of care in family medicine. This conference itself is an example of what I'm going to talk about today. I've been attending Wonka conferences since 1989, my first World Wonka conference in Jerusalem. And over the years have developed some lasting friendships and collegial relations with colleagues from all over the world, especially through URAC, the European Academy of Teachers of Family Medicine and General Practice, which I was pri privileged to be a council member for 13 years. <clears throat> At these meetings, we would meet and greet, exchange ideas, and often uh, have uh, the enthusiasm and the motivation to produce uh, teaching courses for family doctors or to produce scientific papers, as well as sharing our hopes and fears and aspirations related to patient care. This year, of course, because of the coronavirus pandemic, we are unable to meet in person in Berlin and so we are forced to use the technology that is available to us in order to continue with our important work. Uh, so far, so good. And um, this is similar to what has happened in patient care. We have continuity in our collegial relationships and we use the same principles when we use the technology. Now, continuity is a cornerstone of family medicine in the reform of uh, medicine in Portugal, Luis Pisco quoted a few years ago that continuity of care was one of the, the bases, the found, founding foundation stones of um, the reform of, to the creation of primary care medicine. Um, continuity of care used to mean uh, single provider continuity. So you had the solo GP providing 24 hour care, seven days a week, 365 days a year, generally to a stable population, often over 35 to 40 years of a career. And this is no longer so in many cases. However, this type of single provider continuity was a huge asset. Uh, many patients like the fact that their doctor knows who they are. There's a great comfort in having a familiar face um, in the chair across from you. Research evidence that collected over the years suggested that this kind of continuity improved patient outcomes, not the least of which was patient satisfaction. But there was an also a decrease in cost and an increase in effectiveness in the use of medications, in the use of laboratory and other ancillary diagnostic tests, in referrals to secondary and tertiary care, in emergency room use, and in hospital admissions. I reviewed the topic of continuity of care about seven years ago for an editorial for the Portuguese Journal of General Practice in Family Medicine. And at that time, the literature showed that in diabetic patients, in a cohort of diabetic patients, there was actually an improvement in outcomes and a decrease in the death rate among diabetic patients who enjoyed continuity of care. Many other parameters which are followed closely in, in indicator-based medicine uh, also showed improvements with single provider uh, continuity. However, this form of continuity has changed over time into organizational continuity, so that now teams of physicians working in, for example, a family health unit, as is common in Portugal, will provide the care to a patient, so that the patient gets to know a number of doctors, nurses, secretaries, and other medical personnel uh, over time. There is continuity of the medical record as well, with electronic health records uh, providing a kind of uh, organizational memory and allowing for continuity of care in that regard. 
this kind of organizational continuity has many benefits uh, for the physician as well and may be helpful in reducing burnout. But with time and with the growth of uh, digital technologies, we've also seen um, other forms of care which can be provided, such as telemedicine or telehealth. This is provision of care to the patient <coughs> distant uh, from the doctor over some form of electronic media. And with the lockdown and isolation in the coronavirus pandemic, we have seen this come to the fore. I re-reviewed the notion of con continuity of care and telemedicine, looking only at papers published in 2020 and found a large number of publications that looked at the concept of continuity of care in relation to telehealth. Now, I have a personal interest in this because my career took a change a few years ago when I became involved in telemedicine through a colleague in Canada and learned how to provide e-counseling or electronic counseling to patients in six continents all over the world, over 3,000 patients in, in the past 16 years. And what we learned adapting the techniques of family medicine used in the in-person consultation in the office was that these techniques could be adapted to the written medium and to electronic media <clears throat> so that we can have something called text-based bonding or non-local presence where patients feel that we are there with them even though we may be separated by thousands of kilometers. We've recently summarized our experience in using electronic media in counseling and in other forms uh, of counseling in, in a book recently published. And if any of our listeners are interested, I will be happy to provide a link to the book so that you can explore this further and feel free to contact me uh, after the conference. What we have learned from this experience is that while the pandemic has induced isolation and with that anxiety along with the other usual health concerns we deal with in our daily practices, electronic media can help us to break down these barriers of isolation and relieve the feelings of anxiety to restore feelings of empowerment and competence in our patients. I believe that we need to explore the use of uh, these media further and we need to find ways to teach this to our students as we are doing at the University of Minho and Braga here in Portugal, where we're going to incorporate uh, online uh, counseling with patients into the student curriculum so that our students will be at the forefront of this new wave. I look forward to debating these points with my colleagues and taking questions from you um, in the open section of this conference. Okay, hello everybody, and and I would I would like to continue along the line Jona has suggested. So there are all these digital technologies impacting on our practice and impacting on our lives, and I I will approach the the, the theme of our uh, talk from the side of the technologies, and. Uh, I found the, the the nicest way to 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 describe these the notion of escape medicine suggested by British sociologist Sarah Nettleton. What she says there is a double a nice double sense of escape. So on one hand, it's the electronic, the digital space we are now living and working in, but on the other hand, there is escape. So I think, Jona, you used the word, the breaking down of barriers. So the barriers separating medicine and society, they are being broken down by all these changes. And one can understand that in several different ways. So medicine is escaping from previous sources of knowledge and authorities. Usually, previously, this was professors, academics of medicine and health professionals. 
Now, patients can very quickly obtain health-relevant data on their own. They have good reasons for their own suggestions for diagnosis and treatment, and that changes the uh, communication between health professionals and patients completely. And they are even able to join a group so they become influential at a political level. They can contest diagnostic definitions and develop their own ideas regarding therapies. But medicine is also escaping the boundaries of the consultation. Previously, it was just what patients was telling us, tests performed in practice. These were the data we are dealing with. Now it is telemedicine and self-tracking devices which produce medically relevant data outside the consultation. But it's also medicine escaping from the individual patient record. This used to be a scribble on paper. Now it is a digital record. In some countries, even a central record, which can be accessed by different providers within the healthcare system. And these data are transferred to institutions of the healthcare system. They are being used for billing, for research, for quality assurance. And what used to be a piece of paper is now spread over the whole healthcare system. But medicine is also escaping from the body of the patient. Traditionally, it's been the physical presence of the patient in our office. Now there is a third player, that's the computer. And it's no wonder that we are being distracted all the time because the computer is giving us so much data about diagnosis, current therapies, previous reactions, allergies, previous events, and especially in the elderly, patients with several conditions and multiple treatments. This is a massive amount of data and it's not surprising that doctors, we are distracted all the time because this opens up a completely new and vast space of massive amount of data, which are very difficult to handle. We are expected not to commit an error, and this becomes very difficult with this amount of data. Now, most of these changes, or many of these changes, have the potential to improve the quality of care, and Jona mentioned some of these already. And there are other challenges we just have to meet. There's no discussion, for instance, uh, dealing with well-informed patients. What the change I find most interesting is actually symptom trackers. So applications, you put, punch in your symptoms and it gives you a diagnosis and usually also some kind of advice what to do, whether it's to see a doctor, whether to you go to a hospital straight away, and so on. And I just recently came across a, a study published by a Californian healthcare organization, a managed care organization. This was just descriptive data. And they told us, they are telling us that in two thirds of situations of the consultations with this device, there was the, no, in 80%, actually, there was the, the advice, go and see your doctor in 80% of cases. So I think when this, uh, this managed care organization had the idea to save money by recommending their members using this device as a point of entry into the healthcare system, they will not save money by this. And I wonder whether they will actually increase anxiety uh, by, by recommending this device, increase uncertainty. So some patients will follow the advice to the letter and go actually and see their doctor every time. And others will learn to ignore the advice. So we know very little about what do people do with these devices. Uh, how do they uh, appraise what they get? And what I find the most worrying thing really is we do know very little about their accuracy. Do they give adequate uh, advice? How, how 
right is the politi the the diagnostic categorization they provide these are things we just don't know and i wonder whether these devices which are promoted as a kind of competitor to primary care physicians i wonder whether they perhaps open up cascades of anxiety and uncertainty and I wonder whether it is actually the personal physician who is needed to stop this cascade. And I wonder whether it is actually the trust for a person which is needed to interrupt these cascades leading to overdiagnosis and overtreatment. I think what we have to do is not embrace new technologies uncritically, but actually ask for research, like in drugs, like in devices, ask for research showing, uh, demonstrating the accuracy of these devices and also showing us how patients, how citizens uh, are working with them in their lives. And I would like to conclude on a very personal note. I retired from my practice last week and the farewells to my patients was actually a bit of a heartbreaking experience. I had decided to retire, but this was emotionally far more difficult for me than expected. And it demonstrated to me in a very impressive way how important I have been for my patients. Um, I thought as a part-time academic, my kind of practice, practice that, uh, that wouldn't matter to them, but I was wrong. And I got the impression that I've been very important for my patients over the last 27 years in this practice. And it showed to me, it demonstrated very convincingly that the doctor-patient relationship is actually a precious achievement that we really should try to preserve. So thank you, Jona and Norbert for your sharing. Jona, with the huge shift in his practice from face-to-face -to, -face to remote consultations, recognizes the importance of relationships. It's harder to build relationships if we haven't had the opportunity to get to know each other face to face, but we can learn and improve the service. Norbert is taking a positive stance about the opportunities digital technologies offer us, or at the same time, being cautious about the amount of data available and the importance of remembering that our patients are people and not just huge chunks of data. The ideas and views presented here very briefly give us a lot to think about and will hopefully generate a good interaction and question and answer session. So enjoy the discussion. Yes, thank you. Thank you very much, all of you. Yuna and Donald and Norbert. Um, Norbert, what you said was some kind of heart touching for me too. I experienced you in 1993 in the first semester of my medical education when you came from hospital and now you're coming, retiring from practice. So this is a lifetime course we also um, have together. Thank you very much for your um, all of three inspiring inputs. And we have lots of questions now, starting with um, Irina Halberstadt, who is stating a um, very interesting presentation. Yona, do you think then expand use of digital form to communication, we can lose some person-to-person -person interaction, Yona? Yes. Thanks for your question, Irina. Um, we lose and we gain. Of course, there are things that we lose when we miss the interpersonal interaction face to face in the office, um, vocal inflection, facial expression, uh, touch, 
and so on, which are important in, in our practice. But we gain other things, uh, specifically relating to access, that patients have easier access if they have electronic access to the physician. And this can promote continuity of care if there are barriers to access. But we also gain something in terms of empowerment of patients. And we've seen in written communication between doctor and patient that the patient is in control. I can't interrupt the patient when they're writing a letter, as I often do when we are speaking. And the patient is allowed to compose themselves. So we have this co-creation of reality, a co-construction of reality, where patients can write a new narrative and, and find a new path. So I find that we gain a lot uh, from the use of digital media, especially written communication with the physician. Thank you very much, Yona. Um, the next one is just a statement by Bettina Kofler. There are already data that people who Google their symptoms have 30% more anxiety. I think this is a good validation of anecdotal evidence. The next question is by uh, Martina Bischoff. Dear Jona, um, thank you for the um, seminal post. Um, we see the need in teaching to prepare students for the challenges of digital medicine. We have a big problem because our national learning catalog, which is currently being revised, completely excludes these aspects. Do you already have um, implemented a curriculum for digital competencies in Portugal, Jona? Thank you, Martina. That's a wonderful question. And this is a great opportunity for us. Um, no, we don't have a formal curriculum yet. We're sort of organizing on the fly. We're organizing as we move forward and uh, improvising as GPs do. Everything is under control, but everything is flexible. So that uh, this might be a wonderful project for your act or for Wonka uh, to take the lead and um, come up with an ad hoc committee to say, what are the learning needs for introducing digital competencies in practice? And then perhaps Wonka uh, can help us uh, to formalize this uh, in, in, in each of our countries. Great question. Um, the next question is um, stated by Sekaria Atürk, um, also for Jona. Um, I observed, um, or she observed, that during the pandemic, even elderly people became familiar with using the technology. We should try to benefit from the increased information access of our patients in making shared decisions, Jona. Merhaba. <laughs> Hi, Zakaria. Nice to hear from you again. Um, we have a colleague who is a physiotherapist involved in healthy aging and uh, working with empowerment of elderly patients who is actually working, working on teaching uh, digital technology in Perez de Coro, which is a small village in the north of Portugal near the border with Spain. Um, so that uh, there are people who are actively involved as you are in helping me out. And we're, we're surprised that uh, age is not a barrier. Um, it's more about will. So thank you for the question. Okay. Um, the next one is a statement from um, Saudi Naima. It seems um, that the electronic and uh, digitalized era is um, searched upon us with its pros and cons. It is only a matter of time that just like smartphones became rampant and universal. Um, those wearing Google Glass and record whatever we do or have any of a number of unrelated others join every doctor um, patient encounter. We see the advantages as pills that are tagged and can indicate compliance um, cell phones ringing during a consultation interrupts all of us. One thing suffering most is attention to the patient and eye-to-eye -eye contact and personally undivided attention. Patients' voices are seldom heard. Who are the advocates to fight to preserve these critical aspects of patient care? Um, Sodi from Israel. So. Um, Norbert, would you like to comment on that? Yes, I'm happy to do so. Thank you. Um, 
I think we there we are always attracted to the technology and then we tend to forget what happens around the technology. What are the people working with the technology and what also what are the, the organizational aspects involved here? And um, we, we should realize that important things happen on the you and on the soft side as well. So of course there is elderly people who are very keen on community on communicating with us by electronic means but there are others who are just not capable to do so and there is a risk for them to be left behind and there is another another risk that is not very frequently mentioned and that is the a, a proliferation and perhaps even disintegration of providers so telemedicine, telehealth, teleconsultation, that's that can be provided by your usual GP, but it can be also provided by additional doctor services. And this means more providers, more confusion, more disintegration of healthcare. And we have to be very careful whether we end up in a big mess or whether we actually improve patients' care. Thank you, Norbert. Um, the next question is sent by Joao Sequeira Carlos. My warmest regards to the speakers. Thank you for sharing some inspiring ideas. A WHO policy brief about innovation in health systems question why the implementation of e health system fails pointing concerning telehealth evidence suggests suggests that it's best such approaches are unlikely to reduce demand or save costs and at its worst they may compromise patient safety through a tendency to over prescribe particularly antibiotics and analgesics any comments on this, Norbert? You also addressed um, over diagnosis and over treatment in your input. You may comment on that. May I? Speak yes, on I think. Can, can I then continue? Then I... Yes, yes, yes. And then I will ask something, both of you. Okay. Um, I think the, it, it, there is hardly any point in discussing e health as such because. There are so many things we mean by that. We we have to be specific and under this umbrella comes so, so many things and we really have to, to, to name the ones we are talking about. And we, we also should be patient. These are changes that, that are kind of impacting very severely on our patients, on our the care we provide and healthcare systems as a whole and how to adapt to these changes that will take not only years that will take decades so we should be patient and in the long run i think we as individuals as professionals but also healthcare systems will find out what serves their purposes and what doesn't and what even poses risk to patient safety so let's be patient so I want to ask you, both of you, uh, we talked about, you talked about the continuity of care in the new era you know, of uh, digital health, et cetera, but there are other duties or other responsibilities of the family doctor, like being, like being uh, the uh, coordinator of care or the case manager, who will do it in the new era? Jonna, would you like to start? Uh, thanks for the question, um, Shlomo. Um, coordination of care has traditionally been a role of the family physician, and I believe it will remain one of our core duties, but this will also be shared by other members of the team. We have interchangeable roles taken by nurses, secretaries, uh, case managers, uh, people from other allied health professions. Um, patients as well will, are, are part of the team, so that um, I, I see this as a, an evolving 
concept. So there'll be many gatekeepers uh, in the future. Thank you, Yuna. Norbert? Yes, and I think the, the telemedicine media or devices or instruments will actually help us to fill these roles. Yuna mentioned the, the record, the, uh, the communication between different members, of this complex primary care team and communication with patients who are not always being in their hometown, who travel the world, well, not at the moment, but in the future we will do so again. So these new digital technologies will actually support the coordinating the gatekeeping function of the primary care team. Thank you. So uh, Shlomo, I um, move on with uh, some questions. We also have some minutes left. The next question is sent by Mark Alama Ramos from Spain. Once a patient came to my office worried because his Apple Watch detected some seconds of tachycardia. Are we creating over worried patients about their health? Will they, will their health really improve by these kind of tools? So who would like to answer this? Maybe both of you, Yona? Yes, uh, we had a fascinating <laughs> course last year in BLED, in the URAC BLED course on the tyranny of health and in my remarks, I spoke about the watch that I received as a, a gift uh, some time ago, that it's beeping now because it's telling me I've been sitting too long listening to presentations online. So the technology serves us. It, it's a question of who will be the master and who will be the servant. It's a servant, like eHealth is a servant in, in our objectives of improving the health of individuals and communities. So we need like the sorcerer's apprentice to be aware of the, of the magic we have at our disposal, keep our objectives clear. <clears throat> and again, um, consultation with the physician could produce more anxiety uh, than it relieves. And, and it's a question of the relationship that develops, as, as Donald mentioned, um, and how we use the technologies and, and techniques available to us to, to achieve our ends. So we can't just blame the Apple Watch. We have to use it correctly. I fully agree. Thank you, Jona. Norbert, any additional comments on that? Yeah, I, I agree too. And I think uh, this is a very interesting research question. Mm -hmm. um, so we, we want evidence for drugs, we want evidence for devices, and I think we also need evidence for these kind of tools. So I think um, we, have one, we have time for one final question. Um, sent by Bettina Kofler from Italy. Hey, from Italy, with the easier access, the doctor in an electronic way is also a new challenge to define the borders of doctor accessibility. For example, I am not willing to answer a WhatsApp message at 12, 11 p.m. We see more urgent, we, we see more urgent respects of this kind. What do you think about that? Um, I see at Jonas' face that he has a comment on his lips. Yes, um, uh, Shlomo and I worked together for many years in, um, in Israel, in Kupar Cholim, in, in the um, public health uh, system. And you know that there are physicians who could leave, uh, look at their watch and leave the clinic on time. And there are some of our dear colleagues who couldn't leave on time and would stay many extra hours to answer another phone call to, to see another squeeze another patient in and stay till uh, quite late and it's the same you, you have the freedom to turn off the device or the choice not to answer uh, easy electronic access so many of these are internal qualities that we need to help as as supervisors as trainers working with our students and trainees we need to promote uh, work-life balance uh, qualities and uh, the, the creation of healthy limits. So again, it's a question of degree. Thank you, Yuna. Norbert, since you are t um, retired now and you have plenty of time, your patients are sad. Why don't you give them your no mobile number and your WhatsApp <laughs> um, access and they can access you 24-7 um, with questions. So you can 
keep in touch with them and and you have time anyway what about that Norbert? oh they they would reproach me and say oh you are a liar you you have told us <laughs> you you were going to retire and tire now you are back no i think jokes uh, joking aside i think the the point made by Jona, patients will understand that this question very much sounds like uh, patients being greedy for being in contact with us all the time but this is just not true patients know that we need some rest patients know that we need some weekends and it will not be a problem to switch the device off i'm quite sure about that now i would like to give the word to shlomo because my clock says the session is terminated but the green um <laughs> the green bar at the top says we have eight minutes time no. but shlomo you might uh, want to say something and close the session First of all, don't believe to the green light because it's wrong. We finished <laughs> the session, yes, we finished. Okay, so so I yes, want to thank you all, and it was a pleasure to me to see Yona that we didn't meet face to face for many years. Maybe next Wonka meeting or Europe or something like this. And uh, a very interesting uh, talk. I learned a lot, uh, new things. I learned a lot about the the voice style discussion, and it was perfect. Thank you.